What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is incredibly important and I want you guys to rally behind me as much as you possibly can because this video came straight from one of you. I was reached out to a while back and this young woman let me know that she had watched my channel for years and she never ever in her wildest dreams thought that one of her family members would become a victim of a brutal crime. But unfortunately, that's exactly what happened back in 2019 when her great uncle Ernie Ortiz was murdered outside of their family restaurant in Garden City, Kansas. Unfortunately, it seems that the case has sat at a standstill at this point for years. So the entire family has gathered together and tried to push as much as possible to raise awareness on this case, to raise reward money so that hopefully someone comes forward and ultimately to get justice for this man who seemed absolutely incredible and was a pillar in not just his family, but also the community. Now, before I get into the details of this case, I do need to say a huge thank you to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. I feel like I couldn't choose anyone better to be working with me on this video. NordVPN has supported my channel at this point for years, which has allowed me to create this content. It allows me to help these families. And unfortunately, true crime is seen as very controversial. So a lot of companies don't want to support this kind of work. So huge thank you to NordVPN as always. Now, if you're not aware of what NordVPN is, it is a virtual private network that helps you protect all of your personal information while you are browsing the web. Regardless of if you're browsing the internet from at home or if you're connecting to public Wi-Fi, chances are your connection may not be as secure as you think it is, which means hackers can sneak their way in. They can get their hands on things like your passwords, your credit card information, your IP address, your actual address. But NordVPN thankfully covers all of your private information in an encrypted tunnel to keep it out of the hands of those with bad intentions. NordVPN is also super user friendly, which I am very thankful for. There is an app that you can get on your phone. There's also a browser extension, so it's as easy as one single click and all of your private information is protected. You can also have up to six simultaneous connections going on at one time. So if you're someone with multiple phones, laptops, everything can be covered. Thankfully as well, your connection won't slow down. They have over 5,200 servers in 60 separate countries, so you can still stream as normal. I can still upload my videos as normal. Right now, you guys can get a pretty exclusive and awesome deal through NordVPN. All you have to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash Danielle. It's risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And honestly, cybersecurity is so important and in my opinion, very overlooked. So I feel like after you experience it, you're going to wonder how on earth you browsed the web without NordVPN prior. Again, huge thank you to NordVPN. And now on to the details of this case. Ernie was 69 years old when he was senselessly and brutally murdered outside of his own restaurant on September 12th, 2019 in Garden City, Kansas. But while there is a time I'll be speaking about his tragic death, I first want to speak about his beautiful life because the amount of people that Ernie positively impacted, I feel like there's no way to even count them all. It is just endless between all of the family members I've had the pleasure of speaking with, uh, the different interviews that are out there online, everyone from people that he hired within his own restaurant to everyday people in the community at the street, people that came in for a bite to eat, Ernie was incredible. From a very young age, he kind of always had this spunk and this really colorful, radiant personality. He loved music. He learned how to play the organ. He learned how to play the trumpet. He loved to sing and to dance. He loved to perform on stage. If you gave him an opportunity, he was not going to back down from it. He also loved to perform at church. And right before his death, he was actually chosen as the Grand Marshal to play at a fiesta that was held locally every single year. I feel like Ernie's love language was making sure that everybody was fed and also spreading joy through music. Ernie was also described as the patriarch of the family, the glue that held everybody together, which I am sure was no easy task because he was one of 14 children. There were well over 30 nieces and nephews. That's not even counting grand nieces and grandnephews. Family was spread out all over, but he made sure everyone stayed together. 
together. He would hold family gatherings. He would make sure to cook for everyone as much as possible. And according to family, quote, despite the large quantity of people within the family and a huge generational gap, he was there for every member, regardless of how far removed, oftentimes traveling great distances to celebrate the smallest of wins. Words are not capable of explaining how devastating his absence is. He was everyone's favorite, everyone's favorite uncle, everyone's favorite brother. He meant the world to everyone in his family. He was a safe place to land if someone needed a place to sleep. He was a warm plate of food if someone was hungry, a shoulder to lean on, a guiding hand if someone needed advice. His life was not fulfilled if he was not doing everything he possibly could for everyone that he cared about. Ernie also had his own dreams. Growing up, he wanted to open his own restaurant, and after a ton of elbow grease and hard work, that's exactly what happened in 1981. Ernie opened El Conquistador, and everyone knew about El Conquistador, and <laughs> Ernie knew about everyone that came in there. Ernie was there to greet every single customer by name. It was one of the most popular Mexican restaurants in Garden City, and it ended up being the family hangout spot. It, but unfortunately, that is also exactly the place that Ernie had his life so abruptly taken from him. The morning of September 12th, 2019 started off as any other morning. Ernie's sister was in town. She lived in Wichita, Kansas, which is about three hours away, but she would frequently come and visit, stay with Ernie, see family, see friends, go to the restaurant. And every single morning that she was staying there, they had this ritual where they would eat breakfast together. And Ernie was always usually chomping at the bit, ready to go. But this particular morning, she noticed that Ernie was on an abnormally long phone call. For him to make his sister wait on their morning ritual, at least in my opinion, it sounds a little bit out of character for Ernie. So she eventually had to go in and get him, be like, hey, breakfast is on the table, ready to go, and they sat down to have their meal together. But at this point, a few more strange things happened. During this conversation, Ernie brought up his funeral. He brought up general funeral plans, that he wanted to have a large funeral, that he had a very specific way he wanted things to be. He said that he had this paper where everything was written down and he planned to hand it over to his sister. This definitely may seem a little bit alarming to people, um, especially because he kind of was already acting a little out of character that day. It's also possible that maybe he just was speaking about this because his 70th birthday was coming up, which was his other topic of conversation that morning. His 70th birthday was in a couple of months. He was excited to plan his birthday party, as I'm sure you guys can all imagine based on how I describe him. So maybe he was just getting older and realized that he had to start, you know, getting things together for the end of his life. Or maybe he knew that something was going to happen to him that night. After they finished up their breakfast, they parted ways. Ernie's sister headed back home to Wichita and Ernie headed in to work for the day. From my understanding, he was there most of the day and after the restaurant closed up, he gathered the deposit bag for that day and planned to take it down the street to the bank. But unfortunately, at 10.55 p.m., Garden City Police Department and Finney County EMS responded to a phone call just outside of El Conquistador to a man down. And when they arrived, they found Ernie Ortiz laying on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds. Immediately, Ernie was taken to St. Catherine Hospital in Garden City, and all of his family was called to alert them that something had happened when he had been locking up for the night. Right away, Ernie's sister rushed from her home in Wichita all the way back to Garden City. She originally planned to go to the hospital, but unfortunately, during this time, he ended up passing away from his injuries. So at this point, his family decided to go to El Conquistador to see what on earth happened there. It was about 2.30 a.m. and the entire restaurant had been roped off. Not just the restaurant, the entire parking lot, there was even a nearby field. Everything was blocked off as a crime scene. Evidence markers were leading from the door to the parking lot where Ernie was ultimately found gunned down. And there appeared to be a piece of clothing in the location he had once been or some type of fabric that authorities were looking quite closely at. Ernie's family attempted to ask police what on earth had happened, you know, tried to get some sort of information out of them. They had so many questions as I'm sure you can imagine, but unfortunately the police department would not say a thing. 
literally nothing, not the tiniest bit of information was handed over to the Ortiz family. They were just repeatedly told it's all under investigation. It's all under investigation. And essentially were forced to just sit there and watch all of this going on, having no clue why on earth someone would want to harm their beloved family member. Right away, authorities believe that this could possibly be the result of a robbery, which doesn't sound too far off. He was a well-known business owner. Someone likely knew that there was cash in there. If he had this routine every night of taking a deposit bag to the bank, someone could have possibly watched him do this. Um, and so this is really what authorities were believing was the case. However, the family was just kind of sitting back having to trust them because they weren't being given any information. So I honestly have absolutely no clue what the investigation has been like this entire time. What I can say is that there's a 24 hour gas station right across the street, which I'm assuming would have some sort of CCTV footage, even if it didn't show El Conquistador itself and what exactly happened to Ernie. It's very possible that there weren't very many cars traveling in that area at the time that may help authorities narrow things down. Plus, even if there weren't people actively at the gas station getting gas or going inside, there had to have at least been one employee there at the time that may have seen or hopefully at least heard the gunshots. There's also a couple of different hotels directly across the street, which sometimes can bring in unsavory individuals. Maybe someone saw this as a great opportunity to go and grab a little bit of money. And there's also a neighborhood within steps of El Conquistador. There likely were people there in their homes that night. And if there were multiple gunshots that rang out, you would assume that someone heard or saw something. But according to authorities, no one saw or heard anything. However, I have no idea if they checked any of that information. I don't know if they checked CCTV footage. I don't know if they spoke to anyone living within those homes. I just find it a little bit odd that no one saw or heard anything, but it seems possible possible that his body was found relatively quickly after the shooting occurred. So while authorities were investigating, the community and Ernie's family were all devastated and trying to honor his memory as best they possibly could. Ernie got the big funeral that he wanted. Over 200 people showed up to honor him that day. They barely even had standing room. They had to open up all of their extra rooms there. So many people showed up to support the family and Ernie. Also a few days after the murder, Ernie's family decided to very temporarily open back up El Conquistador. They were met with a line out the door of community members, people that were regulars at the restaurant that showed up to support El Conquistador for possibly the very last time. Sure enough, the family ended up having to make the hard decision to close the restaurant down. So they lost the restaurant that Ernie had loved and ran for almost 40 years. And they also ended up losing the family home. This was absolutely devastating. But by September 17th, only a few days after Ernie's murder, something huge happened. A 31-year-old man named Marcus Rohde ended up being arrested in the 300 block of Hillside Avenue at 4.30 in the morning in connection to Ernie's murder and was facing first-degree murder charges. I feel like this came out of absolutely nowhere. There didn't seem to be anything that was said to the public during this time that they were close to someone potentially responsible. I don't know if anything was said to the family. 4.30 in the morning, they are on this guy, arresting him and immediately charging him with first degree murder. So you would assume they hit the jackpot evidence wise, like there had to be something huge, very obviously and directly connecting him to Ernie's murder. Marcus Rohde was not cooperating at all at first. First and foremost, the day that authorities went to arrest him, 4.30 in the morning, he ended up having other charges tacked on of committing a criminal threat towards six different law enforcement officers as they were trying to arrest him. And then when they brought Marcus Rohde in, he also would not provide any personal information for himself, anything at all that could help them get him a lawyer. So they weren't able to proceed as fast as they would have liked to. Eventually, he did end up stepping back and finally giving them all of the information that they needed but not much about him or why he was arrested was released to the public. The only thing that authority said was that this guy was a transient and he was being charged. Now, when I looked into this myself, a little bit of digging showed that he was a transient per se, but he was not at all unfamiliar with Garden City. 
Uh, his mother's obituary shows that she lived there. It has him listed as living in Garden City. Um, he has other charges in Garden City and surrounding counties. Uh, he seemed to kind of, if he wasn't in jail, hop around to different neighboring towns. He sometimes was in Texas. Basically, he was at least in the general area a lot of the time, was very familiar with Garden City, had lived there multiple times. So it's very possible that despite being a transient as he was described, he was familiar with El Conquistador, possibly familiar with Ernie Ortiz, but this guy has an incredibly long track record. He has 30 to 40 separate disciplinary reports from multiple counties, all for drug and criminal convictions. This was obviously huge for Ernie's family because they feel like they are going to get some sort of justice for Ernie, whether they understood why this man was arrested or not, or how he possibly could be connected, this was a step in the right direction. And this happened incredibly fast. We've looked into so many separate cases where in five days, that's like groundbreaking, especially when it seems they were starting from absolutely nothing. This man had no enemies. There was no footage, no witnesses. Now all of a sudden they're able to fully arrest a guy and charge him for murder. But unfortunately, somewhere along the way, something went incredibly wrong. By December of 2020, it was announced that charges against Marcus Rohde were dismissed without prejudice. I don't know if there was some sort of issue, if they thought they had enough evidence and then ended up realizing the hard way that they didn't. All I know is that they had no choice but to dismiss the charges at that point. Because of the way they did it, they did state that it was a possibility if any new or additional evidence was found that they could in fact arrest and charge Marcus Rohde with the murder of Ernie Ortiz sometime in the future. But again, very cryptic. Charges had been filed against him for a year. So for them to suddenly have to be dismissed was a huge blow to Ernie's family, and it felt like it took them all the way back to square one. So at that point, they decided they needed to do whatever they possibly could to fight for answers for Ernie and to get him justice. According to family, this entire time, they still really knew nothing at all about Ernie's death and what had happened to him, why it had happened to him, why Marcus had been arrested, and the authorities were not reaching out to them to give them any information, to check in on them, to give them any updates. They were getting absolutely nothing. And so Ernie's family had to start to reach out to the police themselves. And even when they did, police essentially told them, the same thing they said originally, this is all under investigation and we cannot tell you anything at all. This was incredibly frustrating for Ernie's family because they were having to sit back and kind of hope that the police were doing exactly what they should be doing. And as you can imagine, that's a very, very scary thing to have to sit back and trust. I'm not saying that the police department wasn't doing what they should have been doing behind closed doors to protect the integrity of the investigation, but there was just nothing at all that police were giving the family to make them feel secure in the situation. And because there were no updates at all, there was no communication whatsoever between the police department and the Ortiz family, they decided to investigate everything on their own. And this is when a lot of things really started to not make sense. So this entire time, even after they had dismissed the charges against Marcus Rohde, the Garden City Police Department came forward and said, we still believe that this was a result of a robbery. But when his family started to look into the case themselves and started to look at the different pictures that they had available to them from the crime scene and other things, they realized that nothing had been taken from Ernie after he was shot and killed. Ernie's expensive watch was still on his wrist. All of his nice, expensive heirloom and important jewelry was still on him. And that big deposit bag that he was trying to take to the bank as he was leaving work was still with him. So it became very evident that this was not a robbery and authorities should have known that, seeing that all of these things had been left behind. Fortunately, this entire time, the Garden City Police Department never let Ernie's family be aware of the fact that they had all of these expensive and heirloom pieces from Ernie that the family more than likely would have wanted back. They likely never told them any of this because it did not support the idea that this was a robbery, which was what they were trying to push when they would speak about Ernie's case. When you look at all of this as a whole, I feel like it screams something else is going on here, which is strongly what Ernie's family, who's now investigating all of this, believes. 
He woke up that morning, had some abnormally long phone call. According to the family, they still have no idea the context of the phone call that day. What was so important that took Ernie away from his family that morning? Family was absolutely everything to him. This was a tradition that he had with his sister. My personal opinion is that something really seems off with that. On top of that, he was talking about his death that morning. He was talking about funeral plans. And then later on, he just coincidentally ends up being killed in the parking lot of his own restaurant. I feel like there's a huge chance that he knew something was coming. And why on earth with all of these different facts in front of them that there's no reason at all to believe this is a robbery is the Garden City Police Department still heavily pushing the idea that that's exactly what this is when not a single thing was taken at all. All. Ernie's family believes that this is possibly a personal matter that went wrong, a deal that went wrong. Maybe it was blackmail. Maybe it was organized crime, but there is obviously something else going on here that authorities in the family have not been able to piece together. Now, when it comes to my own personal opinion, the first thing that I thought of when I read all of this information and spoke to his family was, has anyone checked his financials? He was the patriarch of the family. He was who held everyone together. He was everyone's strength. What if something had happened with the restaurant? What if he needed money? Based on what I've been told about him, I don't think he would go to his family to admit there was something going on, to admit that he was struggling or in trouble. Is it possible that he went to ask someone for help and maybe he never was able to get that money back to them? Was that phone call that morning someone demanding the money back or whatever was given to him and he knew there was no way of getting it to them? So that's why he brought up the funeral. I really hope that authorities have gone and sifted through every bit of his financials as possible in the years prior to his death to see was there a chunk of money that came in out of nowhere had he ever been in any sort of financial trouble to me this idea is also supported by the fact that they ended up losing el conquistador as well as the family home had ernie's business been so overwhelmingly successful you know, that he didn't have issues with money or, you know, whatever it may be, I feel like they would have been able to find a way to keep the restaurant, that they would have been able to find a way to keep the house. But the fact that they were not able to find a way to keep either, granted, I don't know all the personal intimate details of it, it makes me believe that there really had been some sort of struggle with money when it came to the restaurant. And if there had in fact been some sort of deal, there had been someone that was angry with Ernie and wanted to take him out, wanted to kind of, make an example of him to other individuals, it would have been as easy as sitting across the street in one of the motel parking lots or sitting at the gas station. And as soon as they saw him walk out, drive by, use a silencer, and no one will see or really hear a thing or connect you with it, which is why I really, really hope they got as much CCTV footage from around the area as possible because my strong belief is that whoever did this to him didn't even get out of a car, didn't think twice about it. They were sitting there waiting for the right moment and then they took it. Either way, I believe that someone knows something and if they do, they need to say something, which is what Ernie's family is now encouraging. If you have any information at all, even the smallest piece that you think may not be important, don't determine that yourself. Hand that information over to authorities, to his family, so that they can determine if that information is crucial to the case or not. So was the arrest of Marcus Rohde just a complete mess up on the Garden City Police Department's part? Or is there evidence out there suggesting he was possibly involved and they just didn't have enough? Clearly, whatever they had, they thought would be enough because of how quickly they arrested and charged him. Um, but obviously that fell through, so there's really no telling. Whoever killed Ernie is still out there. And since they've done it once, they're very capable of doing it again, which is why Ernie's family and hopefully the Garden City Police Department are so determined to bring in this killer. Because if they do that, they make the streets of Garden City a much safer place to live. The case does remain open and active, but as you can see throughout this entire case so far, they keep things very close to the vest to try to protect the integrity of the case. There are so many ways that you can personally help Ernie's family, which again is a subscriber of my channel, one of us, someone that has been here for years at this point. They have formed a team known as Justice for Ernie Ortiz. There's a Facebook page, there is a website, um, and they are really pushing for awareness. That is the one thing that they want 
most out of anything is to make sure that everyone knows what happened to Ernie so that hopefully that can ruffle some feathers, maybe uncover something, maybe someone remembers hearing something and a tip can be put forward that will bring Ernie justice. They also have partnered with Crime Stoppers and have an active GoFundMe. All donations that go towards that will then go toward a reward for information leading to the arrest of whoever murdered Ernie Ortiz. This family is relentless and they will not stop until they have answers. Ernie's loss was felt throughout the entire community. A restaurant that had once been a soft, safe place to land, grab a bite to eat, see Ernie's smiling face had to be shut down. A mentor that managed to employ so many local high school kids and people that had hope for a positive future and just needed someone good in their life is now gone. Ernie did not deserve this and I hope more than anything that I am able to one day sit here and film a video updating you guys that there has finally been justice for Ernie. But I cannot do that without your help. So as I've said before, please make sure to share this video. Go follow Ernie's family so that you can help in whatever way they may need you. I really need you guys to rally behind me and your fellow subscribers that hopefully we can get them justice together. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam. And I will see you guys in my next video.